You're listening to the number two review on MovieHouseMemories.com, the world's greatest podcast for the world's worst films. So pull up your big stool. The fun begins now. Welcome back to the number two review on Movie House Memories, where each episode we pluck one of Tinseltown's biggest pals off the fan and see if it smells as bad as the day it was released. I'm Chris. Hey, everybody. I'm Chad. G'day. I'm Shane. And today we are going to review what is arguably... Marlon Brando's worst film ever. Mm. <laughs> you won't get much argument out of me. Yeah. Uh, 1996 epic, The Island of Dr. Moreau, directed by, well, originally directed by Richard Stanley until he got his ass canned, <laughs> and John Frankenheimer, and starring Marlon Brando, the childish Val Kilmer, David Thewlis, and Farissa Balk. This film had a budget of $40 million and made back worldwide 49.6. So it made money, but I think on marketing and all that, it ended up being a loser. Mm, probably. Uh, this film received six Razzie nominations. Worst picture, worst director. Let's try that again. Worst picture, worst director, worst supporting actor for both Marlon Brando and Val Kilmer. Brando winning it, just edging out Kilmer, which uh, I guess... Uh, worst screen couple and worst screenplay. Lucky for them, Strip Tease was released this year, or they probably would have won a shit ton of awards. I'm trying to figure out how this movie isn't worse than Strip Tease, even though Strip Tease is not that good. This one seems to be much, much worse. Uh, it's more enjoyable to laugh at. Yes, I agree with you. That's sort of the point. Yeah. I can't believe who won best screen or worst screen couple. Demi Moore and Burt Reynolds and Strip Tease. Even Beavis and Butthead were nominated that year. So <laughs> That was a big year. Obviously, that was a really big year. I remember seeing Strip Tease and Island of Dr. Rowe at Moreau at the cinema. Mm. So I paid for it then. <laughs> paid for it in money and time, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, Rotten Tomatoes, 22% uh, critics, 20% audience. Not many critics have reviewed this pile, but uh, um, about 49, 50,000 people did it for audience. So it's it's not a good movie because I'm going to agree with them on that. But uh, Shane, this was your pick. So uh, you, you want to attempt to do a 30 second summary on this pile? I will. And uh, I'll read as quick as I possibly can from the director of hardware. Wait a second. Richard Stanley. He climbed a tree and was sacked. So, from the director of The French Connection to Dead Bang and Reindeer Games comes a film over a century in the making, starring Iceman, Hellboy, Django Fett, the hot goth Nancy from The Craft, Ares, the back-kicking Jimmy from Double Dragging, and The Godfather. The mind of H.G. Wells and the Island of Dr. Moreau classics tale is adapted to the screen for a third time with variable results. Set in 2010, beginning in the uh, Java Ocean, which is really the Queensland coast, three men in a raft knife fight fight for survival and two become shark food. Dehydrated, Edward Douglas is rescued by a seafaring vessel waking up below deck to meet vet Montgomery. The ship arrives at an isolated island instead of civilization, as promised. The pair go to base camp by Jeep, where the Englishman Douglas is told to sit tight, but a dancing girl on the veranda startles his senses. She warns him not to say anything about the island if she helps him escape. That fails. Douglas walks in on a mangy maternity ward. Then Marlon proudly introduces the family. He hosts a dinner party, explains his intentions to create life and be God fusing human genes with animals. Douglas runs again. This time he confronts feral rats in a rat attack. Then there is a cremation for an animal defector and when his furry friend goes through the ashes, a microchip is discovered sparking a realisation that he has one too. And that might be the reason their mad scientist's father can control them with his hand button device before ripping it out and heading off to encourage his mates to remove theirs too. Beasts all question who they are and the island law. 
They have been under for a lifetime until the chant goes up, no more pain, no more law, and a battle in shoes, in, including the sacrifice of the father. Poor Marlon. Basically, all hell breaks loose, although Douglas seems too aloof or in love to try and escape. Uh, he watched Montgomery descend into madness uh, as he imp impersonates Marlon Brando. Um, the beasts with machine guns slaughter their own. Douglas now wants out again, and after discovering his own medical files and experiment results, he really wants out. In a case of the uh, inmates taking over the zoo, a series of perfect explosions, and, and like they're actually really good perfect explosions, they cause less panic uh, as the preacher, or well, actually, they cause a lot of panic, but the preacher beast restores calm, stating that uh, who they are and they don't want any more science. Final narration, and we had this at the start, like a overseeing narration, seems to be political, um, and it's all about global anarchy, and Douglas leaves the island on a smaller, less stable raft after uh, stating he goes in fear. What? I didn't really get that. And then the end credits roll. Now, Shane A., this was your pick, and this is... Probably uh, one of our biggest piles of crap we've uh, reviewed on here in a while. Uh, what drew you to, to make this choice? Just to torture us for a couple hours? Well, I feel like I did, but, you know, I remember seeing it in 96 at the movies and only maybe once or twice since. I mean, that was 21. There's been 21 years in between, but I didn't expect it or think that it was hated so much. And I... I thought it was okay, but then watch rewatching it again. I, I just thought it might have been something that was regarded bad, but not that bad. But I certainly have changed my mind now. Um, yeah, I picked it because of Val Kilmer and the notorious stories that went on behind the scenes. There's a documentary about the actual making of the movie. Um, Marlon Brando, especially, how he even came to Australia to be in this film is is a feat in itself, but the director getting sacked and Val Kilmer making, he made headlines in Australia and maybe around the world. I can't remember at the time, but in Australia, at least he made headlines for his, uh, his behavior on the set. And I saw a documentary on my DVD when I'm watching this film again, it was a really short um, behind the scenes documentary and they interviewed him and he was just like he was stoned or, or talking like Jim Morrison. He didn't actually care. It was, it was really <laughs> bizarre. Uh, yeah. So I, I picked it because I thought, well, it's notorious and I didn't think it was as bad as what everyone was saying, but now I definitely think it is. Well, I it's probably worse. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks. <laughs> I remember seeing this in the theaters. I remember hearing the press about it, and there was nothing about this that sounded good. And I never really wanted to see it and saw it for this show. But, no, I think it, he was he had a lot of notoriety for being an asshole on the set of this, and that was before it came out. I don't know, Chad, did you have the same experience? when? Yeah, yeah I, n I, I did not uh, even think about seeing this movie in any way shape or form it just wasn't quite my thing um and yeah i'm only watching it because of the podcast um but i mean he was coming off of uh, kilmer we're speaking of he was coming off of tombstone where he got rave reviews he then moved on to if i remember right batman forever and that was sort of the beginning of the uh bad behind the scenes bullshit talk about him that he was a stickler on that film and didn't get very many fans. Then, if I remember right, he went from Batman Forever into making this film, and this one, I guess, is where it he was absolutely hated in Hollywood after this movie was being made because of all of his personal issues and just being a dick in general, I guess. Well, I think it was just after this, he made The Ghost in the Darkness with yeah. Michael Douglas, and that was pretty good. Like, and that was well-received and, and a fairly decent hit. He also came back to Australia a few years later and did a Mars science fiction movie called Red Planet. That, mm -hmm. was, film that was filmed in Sydney, not Queensland. Uh, but that wasn't, you know, that wasn't a hit, of course. And He has, actually, Val Kilmer, 
been in a worse movie than this. He was in The Love Guru, and that is worse than this. <laughs> I give you. That. I know the name, but that's it. And Mike, Mike Myers, Myers doesn't necessarily have the best reputation for being fun to work with either. So maybe that's why Val was in it. Justin Timberlake was the only good thing about The Love Guru that mm-hmm. I remember, but I actually refused to watch it ever again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess we know what we're picking next. <laughs> um, but before we rip on the actors too much, uh, I th- one of the things that I think is equally as bad are these costumes. Um, oh, everybody's yes. costume. I, I I can't even point just one out, but this did not even look good. I mean, I I think of movies that were made at that time I think of like maybe the fifth element where there was better costumes um probably about the same budget I didn't look up fifth elements budget but th- this was so poorly done on so many levels I mean because to me even like and I was trying to think of how far back um something even better looked I even go back to the Michael Jackson movie or yeah the video thriller moonwalk and- Moonwalk, yeah, there, there you go. I mean, the stuff that they used, that John Landis used to make those, and even the American Werewolf in London looked a thousand times better than all this stuff. Um, Rick Baker, who's a genius at doing all the monster movies and all that, it, they should have found him if you're going to try to find someone who created great creature-looking characters. They must have just went on the cheap and were like two steps away from being the Planet of the Apes sequels where they just put people in chimp and gorilla suits. You ever see Harry and the Hendersons? Yes, yes. They did it better than this movie, and that was yes. like a decade earlier. Yes, and that's why I was thinking. It's like, where did they come up with all this stuff? I mean, they had to go on the cheap for doing all this makeup stuff, or whoever did it wasn't very skilled or qualified. I, um, I don't totally disagree but i disagree a little bit because stan winston who did the makeup is you know he's pretty well respected and he would have done i think jurassic park was before this and one else gets for it the makeup was all practical and although yeah they're, they're in suits i think uh it wasn't i mean the costumes they were wearing maybe but their makeup wasn't too bad uh i i I think most of the high budget would have went on that. I'm sorry if I'm clouded by <laughs> disagreeing with you, but it's okay. Some of some of it was pretty pretty good actually. And on the little um, behind the scenes featurette that I did see on my DVD, Stan Winston said, "Oh, you know, he was really talking it up as they all do, but he was really talking it up, saying, oh, this is like one of the best. You know, the, I'm so proud of it. One of the best makeup um, p- p- jobs I've ever done." So he thought highly of it, whether it was just for the camera or not. But well, I think I, the detail of it, and it was all practical. If you look at Planet of the Apes and the new Planet of the Apes movies that are out now, they're, mm-hmm. they're digital, whereas yeah. this is practical. And I sort of was referring back to the old ones from the 60s where they just the makeup was great to start, and then they started just throwing yeah. people into ape suits and going from there. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, but... My biggest thing was I had the thought that maybe they just had so many extras and they were trying to get so many creatures um, for this island. That's true. They probably had to start going a little bit on the cheap and just, uh, you know, not being able to focus on a handful that they just started doing what they could with what they had and they didn't spread it out well enough and some of them just didn't look very credible. I wonder if someone would have talked to Marlon Brando when he was first starting out his career and uh, told him that he would have ended up in a muumuu with a white face and a white hat if he would have been disappointed with himself. Because that was, I don't know what was being smoked, but that is not a good look. And that was his idea from what I was reading, that that's how he wanted to look coming up uh, in his initial scene. That it was all his idea. Uh, I think everything was his idea because the fact they got him to Australia to <laughs> on set to make this bloody movie, 
I mean, that he he just said anything, and they they had to go along with it. I mean, that ice bucket on his head yeah. is his idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know. I'm with you, Chris. I just can't imagine the guy who played the Godfather. You know, Vito Corleone being the same person, and that's what just floors me. And I don't know what the hell he was thinking in his later years. I think that whole uh, Apocalypse Now experience changed him for the worse in the long term, and he didn't do very many good things probably after that movie. The Freshman, that yeah, wasn't too bad. Yeah, that was the only one I was thinking of, but, you know, he played Vito Corleone again, basically, so. Yeah. I think he, didn't he, wasn't he in the um, Tom Selleck version of Christopher Columbus as well? There was the Ridley mm. Scott one, 1497, but there was another one that completely bombed that he was in. Because he made, what was it, the score with Robert De Niro and Ed Norton. Um, that was his last film, I think. Yeah, well, a few years after this one, if I remember right, or right around this time maybe, and he was just chewing up scenery and acting like a goofball in that movie. But I did like the score, though. I did, too, and that's what I was going to say, but he was good in a good movie and a decent movie. So this one took my last image of him and made it even worse. Now I didn't see this in any of the documentaries or, or read about it, but I remember this reported when um, at the time in, at least in newspapers in Australia that, and then watching it again, I noticed he has things on his head quite often, you know, either wrapped around his head or, or hats or something. And if you look at one of his ears, it's m more often than not his left ear, but I did notice mm -hmm. it was also his right ear at some point. It's it's covered. And he had apparently um, a little earpiece of people reciting the lines so he could recite them because um, he was forgetting all the time. And then at one point, he was picking up the airwaves. I this is I don't know how true this is, but I did re do remember it. He was picking up the airwaves from the local police station in Queensland, Australia, and starting to recite whatever they were saying on the radio. So it was just all a, a clusterfuck, which I think is a really good <laughs> word for it. <laughs> Personally, I um, think that's his sense of humor, just dicking with people. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. But, yeah, I did notice that this time watching it again. He has got one of his ears covered just about every scene he's in. And, and obviously he had an earpiece in, so you, you couldn't see it. They didn't want you to look at it. Yep. Yeah, because that's what I was reading. The Thulis threw him under the bus for never wanting to learn any of his lines, and they had to be fed to him through an earpiece the entire right. time. Yeah, but it, like Val, I guess, was another one. He didn't want to recite any of the lines and would, didn't want to memorize anything. So they had to, he wanted to just improvise and do stuff his own way. So they had two prima donnas who weren't wanting to do anything as a team player and then trying to basically create their own stuff and then argue with each other, I guess, on the set. So this was definitely the classic clusterfuck situation. <laughs> I, I'm, it's inconceivable to have Val Kilmer and Marlon Brando in the, in the same movie. And I, I had more uh, respect for Val I guess he was going through a period here where he just thought he's, he's, he was shit hot and, you know, he wasn't, but he thought he was. Uh, I, I don't know why he caused so much shit on, on set because he was, you know, he, he was good, but seeing him interviewed on this little behind-the-scenes documentary, he couldn't give a shit. You could just tell. Couldn't care less. And he took the film because he wanted to do it with Marlon Brando. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it, that's a pretty good reason for anyone to take a movie. But, but that still. just seems to be what everybody attached to this movie was the only reason they took this movie was to be in a film with Marlon Brando. And the one person who seemed to give a shit about the movie from the get-go, which was Richard Stanley, he was spent four years trying to develop the film and was passionate about the book and making a great film and... He gets to pre-production and basically they shit can him because after Kilmer shows up two days late and Brando isn't doing his lines and nobody's following the game plan, he gets shit canned because he can't control them all. Well, sorry, New Line Cinema, when you got prima donna actors and a, not a high-powered director, stuff like this is going to happen. And was that screenplay even that good to begin with? 
No, oh, I don't think so. I think this was one of the weakest stories I've ever seen, to be honest with you. I, they said they went through five different writers, um, and I'm sure there were more than that. But this was just a weak story. Was There's nothing really there that even ex- helps you explain anybody's motives in the grand th- scheme of things, other than a couple one-off lines about why Dr. Moreau is wanting to do what he's doing. And then when everybody or the creatures and everybody's opinion change about Moreau, there are once again, just one off lines about everything. Oh yeah. There's heaps of uh, loopholes through this whole entire script, but five writers on it isn't as bad as like nine writers who wrote the debacle specter, the most recent James Bond movie. So, you know, it's, you can have a writer that can write maybe uh, one scene and they're going to get a credit. So, you know, it, it, it it's variable there considering how many writers are on it. But I've never heard of Richard Stanley. I had to look him up. I really didn't know anything he'd done other than Hardware, which I mentioned in the opening, uh, which was a British science fiction movie, which is, was mm-hmm. pretty good from 1990 or very early 90s. Uh, and he apparently did actually climb a tree and stayed up there. <laughs> he didn't want to come back down. So he, he went mad making the movie. <laughs> and that's probably half the reason he got sacked. And to get John Frankenheimer in, he's a very big, well-respected director. And he changed it his own way, obviously. But I don't think he would have still got the results that he was hoping for. Well, he didn't even like Val Kilmer. Mm-mm. Nobody did. Yeah, because he's the one who, when Val's character gets killed off, uh, he basically says, okay, cut and get this bastard off of my set and never have him come back or something of that nature. So pretty much says what he thinks of Val. I wonder if Val was on drugs at this point. Has has he had addiction issues throughout his career? I think they were probably very subtly known, but yeah, I think he probably did. Hmm. Well, as I mentioned, he seemed like he was channeling Jim Morrison, which he played very well in in The Doors, Mm -hmm. just being interviewed. So he didn't seem right. There was just something off about him. Uh, Either he didn't care or he was actually high. Yeah. Well, no matter how much of an asshole he was or how bad his performance was in this film, he was in real genius, so I don't hate him at all. (laughs) And Top Gun. And top secret, by the way. And top secret. I mean, he's made a lot of good things. He has. I mean, like Shane said, The Doors and Tombstone. I mean, the guy is a very good actor and has a lot of skills uh, when he's on his A game. But I also think he makes a lot of bad choices in terms of what parts he wants to take. Um, Man, he's made a lot of shit movies over the years, and this is just one of them. And I think when you take a shit part and tried to make the most out of it and it's not quality from the start. He, he has the skills that he has. It probably just frustrates him and his ego just takes over. Well, I certainly think, uh, the saint was worse than this. That was a pretty terrible movie. Mm. And Val Kilmer went through a whole decade of just making some crook films, but kiss, kiss, bang, bang. When he, he, when he was in that, that kind of started him back on the trage- trajectory as uh, another really sought-after actor because his role in that with Robert Downey Jr. And Robert Downey Jr. at the time, it was before Iron Man, so he was also in a bit of a uh, no-man's land when it comes to movies. And that f- for them both, I think that really started them on the up. And uh, I think Val Kilmer, Bad Lieutenant, was another movie he was in with um, Nicolas Cage that mm. they were – both really good in so i think val's sort of um redeemed himself quite you know quite respectively in certain roles anyway considering he had a whole decade of bad bad films and just uh you know we talked about this being a clusterfuck i sort of took the time to read through like how the cast was supposed to be put together for this film and how many changes they had because originally, with Stanley at the helm, he was supposed to have Brando as Dr. Moreau, and he was supposed to have Bruce Willis as Edward Douglas, and James Wood as Montgomery. Really? But, yep. 
And then Bruce decided he wanted out of it because he was going through his divorce with Demi, so he didn't want to be a part of this. And then James Wood j- just fell out of it. And then Kilmer was hot off a of tombstone in Batman Forever, and he wanted to work with uh, Brando, so they brought him in to be Edward Douglas in the lead role. However, And then they were going to have Rob Morrow, who was from... Uh, the TV show Northern Exposure and um, uh, Quiz Show. So they brought him in to be Montgomery. However, Kilmer was going through his divorce with uh, Joanne Wally at the time, so he wanted to work <laughs> less on the wow, film. This is incredible. What a series of events. Yeah, so he wanted to work less, so he asked the producers to flip-flop roles with Morrow. So Morrow was then going to become... Uh, Douglas and Kilmer was going to become Montgomery, which he followed through with. However, Kilmer was late, a couple days late to hitting the set when he was supposed to. I guess they were having really bad weather and a lot of delays, so Morrow got fed up and was just miserable. So he asked the producers to be let go from the movie altogether. And because he didn't have a whole lot of clout in box office draw, yeah. He was let go altogether. And then Kilmer asked to be let go altogether, but they said, no, you're not going anywhere because they knew he was going to be their big box office draw along with Brando. And then when in the midst of all this, apparently Brando's daughter had recently committed suicide. So he That's was right. a, a little bit um, distraught at this point in time. And then, like we said, Richard Stanley was let go and he was replaced. And then because Stanley was let go, Feruza Balk, she actually left the set and went to an airport, which was like 2,500 kilometers away. <laughs> and they, she tried to get on a plane, but her agents basically told her, no, you cannot leave this and break your contract or else you'll be ostracized from working in Hollywood ever again. Yeah. And, and then, then she made it and was ostracized in Hollywood. for <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. And then, like I say, Morrow left and they brought in Thulis to play um, Edward Douglas. And that's how the that movie was a good choice. Though. I think David Thulis was uh, left of center and who knew him yeah. at the time? I, I remember in the movie Naked, uh, he made a British film, which was a pretty big hit in Australia, at least. But I don't think anyone knew who he was. And he's still going now. He's still acting now. And I think he's OK in this. He's one of the most credible actors in the entire thing. Yeah, he actually it looks like he tried. I'll put it that way. He's most believable. You know, yeah. there's, when, he, when he's panicking and running around and, you know, seeing what he's seeing, you do actually believe him. Well, if I ran onto a boat and saw a bunch of human rats, I would be scared <laughs> shitless, too. I don't remember that. Uh, when that happened in the DVD, when I watched it again for this, I, I had no recollection of the rat scene. <laughs> were did, you scared? I, I mean, they weren't snakes, but <laughs> yeah, they weren't snakes. I I had to do it, the director's cut, so maybe they weren't in the theatrical version, and that's why I don't remember them. But no, I wasn't scared. I was laughing most mostly during the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, we know you don't like snakes or sumo wrestlers, so we need to watch <laughs> out for those in all movies. I do like Faruza Bork though, uh, as not as not as good as she is, and this is an actor. She's good looking, uh, even with fangs. I was going to say, because that was the interesting part of casting her for this, is that the fact that they made her into a cat woman. I mean, she sort yeah. of does have the eyes and the smile and all that stuff and fit that role very well. Well, I never, I never knew until you just said, Chad, about Bruce Willis being considered for this film. And that's funny, because in 95, he actually came to Australia to do a really short promotional uh, tour for Die Hard with a Vengeance. And he mm. came, and he, oh, well, they hadn't built it yet, but he was like uh, standing at the site where they did, where they, were, they made the um, Planet Hollywood, Sydney, back when Planet Hollywood was a very popular chain of uh, restaurants. And he was there, and he was being interviewed and that, and he said he was there for a, I, I've forgotten who was talking to him, but he, he just sort of made a passing comment and said, well, while he was here, he was talking about some film productions in Australia. So maybe when he was here promoting Die Hard with a Vengeance and the new Planet Hollywood in Sydney, he was mm-hmm. actually talking He was actually talking to producers or someone about the island of Dr. Romero. 
So mm. that all makes sense. Cool. Yeah, it would make sense, yeah. Yeah, because until I started reading about the behind-the-scenes stuff after I watched it, I was more, fat. like I said earlier, I was more fascinated with continuously reading about everything. And I actually would like to see the documentary that you mentioned earlier, just to see everybody's face as they talk about all this stuff, because it's just awesome to think about how shitty the situation was for everybody. Well, I haven't seen the whole thing, but I know uh, it's an actual movie that you can get. I'm not sure mm-hmm. if you can watch it online, but I know you can get it. Uh, yeah, it just it dishes the dirt on everyone. And I think they have pretty much everyone involved in the film talking about it as well. They're not, they're not afraid to talk about it in the documentary. And it's meant to be very good, but I've only ever seen little clips from it. I do want to watch the whole thing at some point. Lost Soul is what it's called. Um, yeah. Yeah. And Richard Stanley, like, I don't know if they ever got him for the documentary, but no one has really ever heard of him since. <laughs> <laughs> There's a he, shock. He literally climbed a, a palm tree and stayed up there, apparently. <laughs> well, one of the others. Oh, one of the other stories I read was that he was sitting tight with the the extras and the makeup artists where he actually filmed some scenes towards the end of the movie in one of the creature suits. So he actually got <laughs> on set and is in the movie in the background and snuck his way into the rap party where he and Kilmer sort of kissed and made up. But yeah, that was one of the other little funny side stories about all this. Well, another actor who appeared in it, Tamir Morrison, is a Kiwi actor. He played the the son of Marlon who had the dinner suit on always and the long sort of dreadlocky hair. He's he's the number one. He's highly regarded even now as a Hollywood actor. He was in Moana uh, recently. He's Django Fett in the Star Wars prequels. Yeah. So, yeah. A lot of I think there were some highly regarded filmmakers and actors involved in this film, oh. but it just all, all went to shit. <laughs> I, I'm convinced that Ron Perlman could have played the a character Doctor Moreau and did a hell of a great job for this movie because I'm a big fan of Ron Perlman, not just as Hellboy, but as uh, playing Clay on Sons of Anarchy and doing some other roles. I think he would have been great in something like this. Yeah, he was well, wasted yeah, he, in the film, I think. They they didn't use yeah, it properly. Miscast. Yeah, I, I totally agree, Chris. And I forgot he was in it. He's another actor. I forgot who was in it. And and then I had to figure out who he was. But, yeah, he was the preacher, the, the priest or whatever. I guess my take was this could have been a really, really good, I don't want to say low budget or B movie, but if they would have just gone with some – quality actors who weren't prima donnas or something like that and had a good script to it this could have just been a good movie because it's got a creepy enough storyline to it um it's not fleshed out enough i mean you really don't know like i said earlier what dr moreau's true motivations are and that's the one character you really need to have well defined but this could have just been a really decent watch movie had someone actually really gave a shit about it other than probably Richard Stanley. Um, and even if they would have approached it as like a lower budget B movie, I think it could have been a creepy Saturday night watch maybe to watch, but I don't know is they just, nobody seemed to really care about what was going on. They just did went through the motions. Well, well, I think they might've cared about it in the, in the beginning if they were filming it in sequence because the opening, say, 20 minutes or so weren't bad. Like how we... we the 20 met, minutes without Marlon the, Brando on screen? <laughs> yeah, well, he, he, was la- he was a laugh. I, I, I laughed <laughs> when I first saw him. And I know that um, when they were carrying him on that uh, stretcher thing and he was sitting up on his chair, uh, that was another thing I remember reading about. They, they struggled to carry him. They had to put extra men on there because he was so heavy. <laughs> They nearly dropped him. But I, I don't know. I I think the movie could have been good, and it's been filmed twice before, like I mentioned. Uh, Burt Lancaster did the 70s one. He played Dr. Moreau. I don't remember the 30s one. It was made in the 1930s. And the book was written over 100 years ago, so the story's there. And, it, you know, they could flesh it out and make it good. But I think 
they had good intentions like most people do when they make movies, but this film definitely considering everything that went on and the Australian weather in Queensland is pretty unpredictable. So whether that had something to do with it as well, um, there's a lot of monsoons and rains and then one minute it's hot and cold. So that could have had something to do with production, which always stuffs up movies, but yeah, the potential was there, and but it seriously lives up to the uh, hype of being one of the worst films ever made. All right, guys, let's go around the table. Um, do you consider this a cult film, a cult bomb, or a complete bomb? And in all the number two reviews, is this in your top half or bottom half? Chad? Um, I know this thing allegedly made some money, but... I'm going to call this a complete bomb, and I don't know of anybody who actually likes the movie in a cult-like sense, so yeah, it's a complete bomb for me. Um, it is one of the worst ones that I've seen or reviewed for this podcast, so it's definitely my bottom half and pretty far down. It's almost a waste of an hour and 40 minutes of your life. <laughs> So unless you really like horrible movies and maybe learning about the bullshit that goes uh, goes into making a horrible movie, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> uh, and that's you being nice. Yeah, yes, I'm trying to be real nice about it. I can tell. Um, well, I'm going to agree with what Chad said. This is a complete bomb. It's a pile of shit. It's, it's <laughs> probably one of the worst we've reviewed. I was bored by it wasn't amused by anything and you could tell that it lacked uh any sort of real passion from the actors in this one the the story was it was very basic and even non-coherent at times so not a big fan of it won't see this one again <laughs> uh but shana you put us through this one and we'll give you the <laughs> final word on that uh yes and Thanks, Chris and Chad, for going through the motions of watching this. And, you know, like, uh, you, I hope you do get back your um, 100 and minutes of life. <laughs> but And Shane T, I mean, seriously, I would love, if you're listening, mate, I would love to know what you think of this pile of crap. And I'm sorry, I thought it was better than it is. But is it the worst movie ever made? No, no. I laughed through this. And I thought Stan Winston, Winston's practical makeup was the highlight in some respects and it was made in Australia. So I've got to, you know, back that, although we have had a lot of rubbish made down under it's no cult movie, but people still do refer to it and talk about it. Um, Val Kilmer, when he's interviewed, he never used to, but now he does actually talk about it. So uh, it's come back it, full circle basically for people to discover. And it is in the lower half of the movies that we have reviewed for number two review. I'll definitely say that, but it's not, not at the bottom. Uh, yeah, I, I'd say check it out if you're interested and watch the documentary as well. That might make the film a little bit better. All right, well, it's time to put this episode shit show to rest. Please let us know what you think of this film in the comments section on our website and let us know if you could have done a better job than Marlon Brando. <laughs> <laughs> if you have a terrible movie you'd like us to review, please send us an email at comments at moviehousememories.com with your name, city, and pick. Until next time at the number two review, I'm Chris. This is Chad, and I'm off to watch striptease. <laughs> I'm Shane A. Thanks once again for listening, and remember, if you're going to sneak into a movie, make it a good one. This podcast is not endorsed by New Line Home Video and is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. The Island of Dr. Moreau, all names and sounds of the Island of Dr. Moreau characters and any other The Island of Dr. Moreau related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of New Line Home Video, all the respective trademark and or copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of the number two review the mhm podcast network and fuzzy bunny slippers entertainment llc unless otherwise noted